Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our faculty seminar. My name is Miles Ruchicek. I serve as the Associate Dean Research for the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences. It's a real pleasure to be here today and be the MC for today's seminar. Before we start, uh, I'd like to remind you all that uh, this seminar and others are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel of the faculty, as well as it, uh, on makemanitoba.ca, which is a knowledge, knowledge exchange portal, if you like. So if you uh, want to share this presentation with colleagues that couldn't attend today, or friends or students, please feel free to do so once it's posted up there. Um, other than that, I wanted to say that this seminar series this year has a theme, and it is digital ag, or some call it ag tech, some call it precision farming. And just a month ago or so, we had a presentation on livestock area. Today, we will focus on uh, weeds and crops. But we have a special guest from outside the faculty, Dr. Chris Henry. So I will go ahead and introduce him. Uh, Dr. Henry joined the Department of Computer Science at the University of Manitoba in July 2023. Prior to that, he was a professor in the Department of Applied Computer Science in the University of Winnipeg for 13 years. Dr. Henry received his BSc in 04, his MSc in 06, and his PhD in 2011 in electrical and computer engineering here from the University of Manitoba. So we're you know, happy to have him back home. The focus of Dr. Henry's work is the theory and application of machine learning, and he has extensive experience working there as digital ag and remote sensing. He has already established some close collaborations with some of you in the room, and I look forward to his talks. So take it away, Chris. Great. Thank you, Nazem. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. And uh, this, this is a great opportunity um, to pr talk about some of my work. OK. I'd like to start uh, a lot of my talks with this cartoon. Uh, so it's uh, the ideas we're going to be talking about today have been in con people's consciousness and minds for 70 years. Uh, and so uh, I will be talking today about uh, a sliver of some of the uh, the ideas uh, that you see in this cartoon um, that are developed uh, by my research group called uh, the Terabyte Research Group. Uh, the focus of our group is developing or creating uh, labeled data sets for machine learning applications and using that those that label those labeled data, data sets to create machine learning uh, models uh, and algorithms. Um, our group is led by uh, the three of us that you see here. We're the principal investigators. And a lot of the work that I'm presenting today is due to a lot of people that work for our group. Um, this column on the, your left is all of our present uh, HQP. And then on the, your right is uh, the past members. And so a lot of the past and current members have touched upon uh, some of the work uh, that I'm going to present today. Uh, so this talk will be divided into two sections. I'm going to start with uh, terabyte in general, the types of uh, data that we create and the label uh, and how we label this data. And then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the machine learning model uh, projects that I that I'm leading uh, together with my students and then end the talk with uh, some future directions and collaboration opportunities. So Terabyte in general has spent a lot of time since 2017 thinking about and creating a labeled data sets. <laughs> and uh, a lot of our funding uh, and our motivation for creating these labeled data sets is to make them openly available uh, to, to spur innovation in the digital agriculture space or in the agriculture space. So um, most, if not all, the data that you see that we talked about today, if it excites you, uh, it's available to download and, and to use. And so uh, reach out uh, to me afterwards and uh, similarly with the uh, machine learning models. So uh, we start, uh, sorry about the types of data that we generate. Uh, we start with indoor data. Uh, we have a growth chamber where we grow um, a lot of the plants that we, that we use to, uh, to produce our labeled data sets. And one of the first thing we developed was this robotic camera system. Uh, this camera system, uh, you can put plants in, let me bring up the pointer here. Uh, this, this unit is uh, one meter by two meter by 1.5 meters. Uh, so the imaging volume is quite large. Uh, you can put plants within this volume and because we have full control over growing them in the uh, growth chamber, 
and we know what they are, uh, we can then ramp up uh, labeled data set ger generation quite quickly on the order of uh, 200,000 to 300,000 images a month if we have it uh, going full out. And uh, what I don't talk about in this particular talk is that uh, we can create bespoke label data sets uh, and then we can make them look like it look like outdoor data for outdoor applications. Uh, in addition to this system being an RGB uh, image generation system, we also uh, have a multi-spectral plant scanner. It's a, it's a line scanner that collects a point cloud in, in one dimension and that's an RGB and near infrared. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've developed uh, a, a way to collect 3D point clouds like you see here um, from all around the plant. So um, we have a system, a photogrammetry system where we've put the plant on the tabletop here and we have a series of cameras and we spin it. And the advantage uh, of this system, in addition to creating labeled point clouds uh, or plants that we're interested in, is that we get the full, uh, the full view of the plant that we're imaging rather than just one uh, one plane like you see here. The other advantage is this is a $75,000 scanner and the parts for this cost less than $2,000. So that means that we can get this uh, equipment into the hands of people that can uh, do interesting things with it. For instance, we're building, we built one for uh, Steve Wired um, and Mark Belmonte in the biological sciences department. Um, and we want to build one for some collaborators at USASC. In addition to uh, RGB and point clouds, we also have hyperspectral uh, imaging equipment uh, to create hyperspectral data set um, and uh, look, see if we can detect patterns uh, from the reflectance and, and different wavelengths that maybe helps algorithms uh, make decisions uh, uh, or find these patterns using this extra data. Uh, we also have a data rover uh, that we bring into the field, and it serves two purposes. It's for uh, additional data collection, but also to test our machine learning models in the field. And we have some examples of that uh, in, in the slides coming up, uh, where we uh, did some live testing. Uh, we have uh, funding to build two more prototypes. And so one we're building specifically for uh, Dr. Um, Antonio Enriquez, uh, Fusarium Head Blight Screening Program at Morden uh, to help expedite the assessment of FHB. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. This is that prototype that I mentioned is almost complete. No uh, electrical has been installed in it, but all of the uh, structural and mechanical has been developed. And we now need to just add the electrical before spring, summer of 2025. And we've been collecting, like many people in this room, have been collecting field data. We've been doing it since 2019. Uh, so 2019, 20, 23, and 24, uh, we collected data innovation farms uh, in this area that they provided us here. And this is the fellow who is in charge of the data collection. That's his son uh, driving the tractor. In 2021 and 2022, they uh, started to allow us for those years to just have this plug line untreated so we could collect the data. Um, so we have this data uh, as well. And we typically collect it with a tractor um, and a camera and a boom, although we've upgraded the, the camera since uh, this photo. We have not forayed uh, much into drone data collection. Uh, we have a bit of drone data collection from the Morton Research and Development Center. And then I'm working with uh, Rob Golden, Dilshan, and Nassim on their project that they're leading. Um, with uh, drone data collection. And so I hope to get uh, more into uh, the, the, that side of imaging uh, for different applications. And then one aspect that's not the most exciting uh, part uh, of the work is actually making the data available for others to use. It's uh, not as, uh, as straightforward as you might think when the data volume gets large. Uh, and so we've developed the portal through that's hosted by the D Digital Research Alliance of Canada. We have uh, a local storage, uh, a local server. Uh, it's uh, one of these that, that we see here, uh, 480 terabytes. And that uh, system is mirrored to an object storage system hosted by the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. And then we have a cloud instance that runs a portal that allows people to uh, access the data. And we spent actually a lot of time uh, and energy trying to get this uh, working so that 
you know, you can get data quickly, even if there's multiple users uh, accessing the system. Uh, and so when I say it's uh, any of the data in this talk is available, it, it would be available via this portal. OK, so now I want to talk about uh, a few uh, digital ag applications. Um, the first one that I want to cover is on fusarium head blight detection and severity uh, assessment. And this is uh, starting with our 3D point cloud uh, data. So um, many of you in this room know about uh, fusarium head blight, um, more details about it than, than I do. But uh, for those of you who don't know, it's one of the most or the most significant uh, wheat disease. And the best uh, way to fight uh, FHB is through developing uh, resistant uh, varieties. Uh, and this work is done uh, one of the largest nurseries for doing this work is at the Morning Research uh, uh, Research and Development Center. And so they, the general uh, approach to doing severity assessment is looking at the, the number of spikelets on the wheat head that are infected uh, and then doing an assessment per head. Uh, but then if you're talking about in uh, field plots out in the field, you have to generally do a general assessment um, of how much, uh, it, on average per plot, how much of the head is infected, and then how much of the plot is actually infected. And it's quite general. It's usually in 25% uh, increments. Uh, and so we wanted to see this work was, the, the point of this work was to see if using that uh, multispectral scanner that I mentioned, if we can develop a method A to detect the presence of fusarium head blight, and then if we're successful detecting the presence of fusarium head blight, can we develop a method and automatically uh, assess the severity index? And so we need to work uh, closely with uh, the Modern Research and Development Center because we didn't have the capability to uh, inoculate uh, any of the wheat that we grew. So their team set up uh, the wheat experiments uh, according to standards in, in their profession and inoculated the wheat. Uh, and then we brought uh, the scanner out uh, to the Modern Research and Development Center and uh, set about scanning uh, the wheat heads, uh, uh, the, the wheat plant, the entire plant with the scanner. And then as we're doing it, we relied on their technicians to have an assessment of the, the severity of uh, each of the wheat heads. Uh, once we uh, went through that process, uh, we won this work. Uh, the work I'm presenting today is considered developing models uh, and two approaches. And one is by putting uh, the, the 3D point clouds into a structured grid, and then the other is working uh, just with the point clouds themselves. And so the first step that we took was uh, working with this structured grid. So imagine this line scanner uh, scans the plant and it's finding points in 3D spaces based on reflectance uh, that comes back to the sensors. Well, those points arrive in, uh, they can be in any order and they're not, um, they're not structured with respect to each other. So uh, you get a list of points and those points come with coordinates. They also come with an RGB and near infrared value. And then if you were to take that point, those points and then plot them, you would plot them all over the place in 3D space. Uh, that's fine, but uh, when you use machine learning models, one of the power, one of the benefits or advantages of using them is you're not just making decisions based on spectral signatures of points, you're making decisions based on structural uh, and shape-based components of the data. So in order to do that, uh, one approach is to put the, the data, the points into uh, a regular grid. And we did some of that through processing with, with CUDA using uh, graphics processing units. Uh, and then once we had the data in the order that we the, we wanted to work with it, uh, we had we took a few different approaches. First, uh, can we detect it? Uh, then we weren't sure if we were when we set out if we were able to detect it. The next was can we just count the number of heads? Can we develop a model that uh, counts the number of spikelets on a wheat head? Uh, one, if we were successful for that, could we then develop one that counted just the infected spikelets? And if that was successful, then it's logical to assume that you could skip these two, uh, which are required to do a manual uh, a manual calculation of the severity index, and just go straight to the severity uh, assessment calculation. Um, just go straight to to a model that can uh, determine the severity uh, severity assessment on its own. And so, uh, if 
what we want to put this into practice for use in the indoor greenhouses at uh, the research center. And uh, the pipeline that we have set up would be something um, along the lines of you, you scan uh, a lead head. Once you scan the lead head, you determine uh, if Fusarium head blight uh, is detected or not. Um, if it is detected, uh, then you can consider one of these two methods to do uh, to do the severity ass assessment. Otherwise, just for our work, we were also just um, counting the total number of spikelets uh, for in, in the event, even if there um, was no, uh, even if we didn't detect the presence of Fusarium head blight. Uh, so for this work, point clouds are three dimensional, and so we naturally wanted to work with. Uh, three-dimensional convolutional neural networks. It is possible to work with convolution, uh, two-dimensional convolutional neural networks. The main thing here that you, that's the reason why we went with uh, the three-dimensional case is that when you're convolving uh, the filters, you convolve them in 3D space. And that's important to capture the 3D structural information. And if you take that approach, uh, the idea is the third dimension um, should provide more information to the model to make a decision, and therefore you don't need as much data. So if you've heard about training convolutional neural networks, they can sometimes require tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of samples per class, depending on the type of network that you're working uh, that you're working with. And then once we uh, once we decide on this approach, we created our models from scratch. And in this case, we did a grid search on the different types of parameters, the number of layers, number of densely uh, connected layers, uh, and so on. And we had uh, we had a, a small size data set because we were collecting this data manually and, and labeling it manually. Um, and so taking this approach, uh, we then searched our, uh, we went through our search space uh, to find the optimal uh, design of our convolutional neural network. And for the different uh, types of problems that we were trying to solve, so classification, number of spikelets, number of infected spikelets, and severity, uh, uh, severity index, um, these were the different uh, model parameters that we came up with. Uh, and then these were some of the results that we had. So first, uh, this section is just uh, Fusarium head blight detection. We tried just the RGB point cloud, RGB and near infrared, uh, and near infrared. Uh, and if you look at the test accuracy across uh, the different types of models that we considered, uh, we got 100% accuracy on our test set um, when working with just the RGB, um, just the RGB values, uh, the RGB values associated with each point in the point cloud. For total number of spikelets uh, estimation, uh, our test uh, mean average error, uh, we got a best mean average error um, between the 3D uh, CNNs that we developed. We also tried converting some popular uh, models uh, to three, three dimensions to see how they performed. And we actually did, our model did as well as ResNet B2, but our model had significantly less parameters, which means uh, uh, if you look at the in inference time, our inference time, uh, what's not shown here, I believe this is in milliseconds, uh, is significantly lower than the ResNet, which means that um, we consider it a superior solution. Uh, and you can take a look at the results similar for a number of infected uh, spikelets and severity estimation and the values that we have uh, are here. Uh, then, we, uh, then we did a linear regression analysis of uh, the manually assessed severity index and uh, the severity index estimated by the 3D convolution neural network. And we were uh, happy uh, with, with the result uh, that you see there. Um, so we, this was great work and it, it was wonderful and we're happy with the results, but it was for one uh, we had at a time. Uh, I didn't really highlight it. We would, we would scan one plant and for this to be of use either indoors or outdoors, but the next step would be to get this, the first step would be to get this to work indoors. We're gonna need, in, if in an actual FHB screening program, you're not just doing, you're gonna have one, you're gonna do have multiple. So the next step in this work was we modified uh, the scanner. So instead of being top down, because we were top down, we had to tip over the plants when we scanned it. Um, 
so we we modified the scanner so it could go uh, in a um, a horizontal plane, uh, and then we also put it uh, on this movable um, this movable apparatus here, so that when we actually take it to, to Morden, it's more um, it's more usable within their their daily operations, their screening operations. And so the next step was the of this work uh, that we're currently at is to do wheat head identification. So you scan. Uh, you scan a series of wheat plants. It's wonderful. We actually have to do assessment on the wheat heads uh, themselves. And so in order to do that, you actually have to find where they are in the point cloud. And so that's uh, what uh, the focus of this work was. And we, for uh, this particular project, we decided to tr try out approaches where we didn't actually have to put the, the points in an ordered grid because that was part of the computational complexity. Uh, and there is a lot of wasted space. If you put point clouds into a structured uh, grid in 3D, you're going to get all your data points, but you're going to have a lot of points uh, around that plant that are just null values and actually don't contribute to any of your calculations. And so point, uh, this point net, um, I refer to other people's work. I give uh, the references down here. PointNet uh, provides a solution to that problem by working with the points directly uh, and not having to uh, put it into a structured grade. And um, in order uh, to use this network, it requires a fixed number of input points, um, but we couldn't guarantee that because uh, you know real life is messy, and we'll have all sort. We had all sorts of plants that we were putting in front of our scanner. Um, I should mention we grabbed 576 samples where a uh, number of wheat heads per image range from three to 11. Uh, and so what we would do is we would uh, put a sliding window through our point cloud uh, and just grab uh, different sections of the data set. And this actually led, led to a natural data augmentation. So we were able to significantly increase our data set by doing that. Uh, and the only problem is your number of points is not necessarily, or the size of your window is not necessarily a multiple of the uh, of the input number of points uh, that you need for the network. So we would go left to right, discard uh, the last one, and then go right to left, and then disc discard the first one. So we had uh, uniform uh, uniform segments. Um, and then taking this uh, approach, though, you have to eventually classify this data. And so when our model, if our model is producing results, it would be great if I identified the wheat head in uh, both segments, but it's not necessarily guaranteed because you are slightly changing the problem. So then we, uh, we looked at, well, how we would uh, combine the results of the model afterwards and we took an AND approach or an OR approach. So the AND is it had to be classified in both segments in order for it to be classified as a wheat head or the OR approach where uh, in either segment, if it was identified, uh, then we considered um, a success. Uh, and so we then did a similar uh, approach where we did uh, this uh, grid-based op uh, optimization of our algorithm and considered different configurations uh, of input size, epochs, batch size, learning rates. Uh, decay rate was just at, at 0.5. And taking that approach, you know, our, our accuracy for identifying the wheat heads range from 79 uh, to 82. And for the uh, both for the logical or and the logical end. And then here's uh, some sample results from, from our work. So this is uh, a projection of the 3D point cloud in, in 2D uh, space. Uh, uh, box B is the ground truth. So this was manually annotated um, by our team. And then C is the results from OR and D is the results uh, from AND. And so this is where we're at right now. We want to eventually, uh, once we move past this, we want to then do some, once we have identified the heads, we want to do the severity assessment for multiple wheat heads and then put this um, into production at the Morton Research Center. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then thanks to Kurt McCarthy, I don't know if he's here, but he identified, he, he told us about this work uh, where they're doing similar, but with 2D methods um, right on the field. And so we just did a quick test from some of our rover data. You can see the rover wheel there to see how it worked. And at first pass, uh, and because Morden had uh, 
had set aside some research plots for us to drive the rover through and collect data that wouldn't affect any of their experiments. Um, first pass, it looks like uh, it's working. So when I come back to this in future directions, uh, this will be something that uh, we'll consider as well, because um, we want to, uh, a solution both for the field and for uh, the indoor case. Okay, so that was the first application. Uh, next application is uh, uh, plant classification or, or weed classification. Um, and so in this approach, we wanted to use some of that data that we had mentioned uh, where we had uh, weed-free crop imagery or field imagery, and we had uh, uh, field imagery where we let the weeds grow. And we wanted to see, we developed ways to wrap up data set creation because the biggest bottleneck for machine learning development is creating the labeled data sets. No matter what you want to do with machine learning, if you don't have the data to support it, and you can see that in my next uh, application, the last one, uh, then um, you're not going to be successful. And so this approach uh, is an area of interest to me, is how we can use some of these generative models to synthesize the training sets for, um, to reduce the, the, the amount of time and, and money it takes to develop these models. So what did we do? We went through our data that had crops. We picked um, a soybean uh, and we went through the soybean uh, imagery and we worked with, with Emily to determine a particular age of crop and a particular age of the weed. And we went through and we manually uh, annotated uh, the weeds uh, in the imagery, the video, the frames that we got from our video uh, to something like you see here. Then we trained a style GAN uh, produced by NVIDIA to create synthetic weeds and we could then produce a whole bunch of these synthetic weeds. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. So uh, this is red root pigweed. Um, four of these are real, four of them are fake. I won't put anyone on the spot. Uh, and all of this slide and the next two, the top four are the real ones. And the uh, bottom four are the synthetic ones created by the generative method. And we did uh, yellow foxtail. And this one, I think, is the most easiest to tell which real we did kosher as well. And here the shadows, I think, give it away. The shadows look more realistic than the ones created by the um, by the GAN. And there is some artifacts in these. Um, OK, so once we had a bunch uh, of these uh, types of weeds, we went through our weed free imagery and we found around 3000 uh, background imagery. Um, what, what we consider background is uh, weed-free or almost weed-free imagery. And we want to use these to create our synthetic data set. So we would then, because our resolution of our image is quite large, we would then, uh, we would then crop out pieces of 512 by 512 from this data. We would use, we then use uh, this same model called leaf segment anything model to find the location of the plants in the existing imagery that we have, because this is a, these are places where we did not want to put uh, the weeds in our synthetic imagery. So once we use that uh, segment anything model, we have these masks where we need we know where not to place the weeds. And then what we do is we start creating our synthetic data set. So we randomly pick. Uh, from our background and its associated mask, uh, like our pool of backgrounds and associated masks. We then randomly pick uh, one or two weeds from that pool of uh, fake weeds that I mentioned that we created. We, uh, we then use a pseudo random number generator to determine what sort of augmentations we're going to do. So if we'll resize, flip horizontally, flip vertically, rotate. Uh, once we go through those tests, we take whatever the result was and we we recrop it if we need to to make sure it's just um, just the, the the plant in the image. And then we place this uh, weed on the background and we found it's you can't really see in this uh, slide, uh, but it is there. Um, we added a little bit of shadowing uh, to the, the image uh, as well. Um, and then once we do that, we know everything about the the with the plants in the image. We know every pixel about the plants before we place the weed because of the segment anything model. We know everything about the weed uh, plant because we actually put it there ourselves. And we could create a, a labeled data set uh, for training a model. And so 
the model that we use, uh, one of the best object detection models around is, um, uh, or the, one of the leading models is YOLO, and we use particular uh, version V8. Um, and we picked it, but as I mentioned, state-of-the-art performance, it's also a fast inference. Eventually, this needs to work in the field if it uh, works successfully and, you know, it has a wide user base. Uh, so our test results uh, are here. We trained one YOLO model per weed, and our training set was 100,000 images per weed using that process uh, that I mentioned. Uh, this video shows... Um, this video shows all three models uh, doing inference on the same image, and then we superimpose um, we superimpose the results of each model together. So we have uh, red is the red root pigweed, I think it's orange is the yellow foxtail, and we have blue uh, is kochia. And we went and um, manually went through some test images to calculate some metrics here. And the way we went through and calculated the metrics is we consider it a success if the lead has a bounding box around it at any point when it comes into the field of view. So we were happy with this, uh, but this is our test data from test footage that we collected uh, that we collected um, in previous years. So thanks to this department invited uh, me to the Carmen uh, Research Day, um, and there are some test plots. Uh, sorry, this faculty, but the, the Department of Plant Science, there are some test plots that had just weeds growing in it. And so we thought that would be uh, a great use case to test this model, show, showcase it to uh, a bunch of other people, and then see how well uh, it does in the field. And this is a video from that day before the giant crowd was there, um, where we just ran it through just for the yellow foxtail model. Um, and it does a decent job. Um, but it doesn't, it's too fast to, to see that my leg and foot, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't get all of them. And so we have some more work to do. Uh, we only you use a certain range of, um, age of, of weeds in our test set. So I think if we increase, uh, increase the, um, the range of the weeds in our training set, as well as the range of props in our, our set, uh, we can, uh, we can do better and have a better model for next summer. Uh, and then on to um, the last application. So this is feed, field P yield prediction. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind when you're doing machine learning project is that you first really need to do a deep dive uh, into the data. And um, part of this project had two components to it, creating the data and then developing machine learning models from this data. And we're, I'm just presenting some lessons we learned about working with the, the data set. But what, it, what I want to get at is that sometimes you just uh, will not have enough data to uh, achieve the type of performance that you want. And you have to be careful of that. Machine learning is doing a lot of great things, but doesn't mean it can solve um, every problem. And so this project was in collaboration with the National Research Council of Canada, uh, Emily and Innovation Farms. And the idea here is we want to do... Uh, two aspects. We want to see if there is a way to predict uh, field field uh, uh, P yield in the field from field imagery only. Um, we want to, because uh, the N NRC Saskatoon um, office also is very interested in root structure. So we want to develop a method to autom automate the identification of root nodules. Um, and which we haven't uh, got to yet is how can we combine this information above ground and below ground in order to maybe increase um, increase uh, prediction um, yield prediction results. Uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit uh, later. So what we have in this data set is we have two seasons of yield data covering 36 distinct plots. Um, in 2023, uh, six collection dates. In 2024, 10 collection dates. And each plot had four distinct videos, depending on how the camera went over it on the day it was imaged. And what means we have roughly uh, 720 images per time date per plot. Um, or if you just consider the plot from the start to the end of the season and you're looking at time series, 
uh, 144 time series videos. And the resolution of our images is 38, uh, <clears throat> sorry, it's missing, 3840 uh, by 2160 pixels. So some of the things that we considered in this work, uh, some of the different types of experiments that we tried, uh, is yield prediction uh, with P images. So it's all yield prediction with time series P images, with time series crop videos, and then just a ma manual analysis uh, of the data. And so if just uh, to keep in mind what we mean by um, if you're talking about just the P images, so we have some sort of model as input, you present the image and you try to get some sort of output. In this case, it's a real number. Or time series, you present a series of images to uh, a model and then the output is a classification or uh, a real number. So we knew from the beginning, we were working with a small data set. So we really wanted to see existing methods that did well with small data sets. And one of them is this approach, uh, is this approach here. And the idea is you, because the data set is so small, you work with a known machine learning model as a feature extractor. Uh, in this paper, they use AlexNet, which is one of the first models. Uh, we've experimented with other types of feature extractors. But uh, you use this uh, pre-trained method, and then you pass it into uh, another model. And the other model, the job of this other model is to learn a, um, uh, learn a way to enhance or extract and change the dimensionality of the feature um, that was generated from, uh, from this model. And then the idea is that if it's a time series input, that the way that you train the, the stage of the model is that if it's time series input, the output that you get at, for, in, for instance, F1 should be closer to F0 than F0 is to F2. Uh, because the idea is the data is uh, progressing in a series and it's of crop data. And so this idea of monotonic crop growth in the time series. And then you train uh, this model in two phases. You train it by freezing this and, and training this with this loss function. And then once this is trained, you freeze this and you fine tune this uh, also with this loss function. And then you create this uh, time embedding where you subtract from each one of these the original feature vector. And that should be a, a very nice descriptor of the input at that particular point in the time series. And from there, you can do whatever you want with them. You could, for instance, just use a clustering uh, tap, tap, uh, algorithm if you are going to do um, classification. Or in terms of regression, you can use a fully connected neural network or support vector machine. Uh, and so we tried that. We tried that by swip, swapping out this uh, feature extractor with different types of um, more current networks, like Inception V3, Vision Transformer, and Swin Transformer. Uh, and so swapping out this part here, um, and uh, we weren't, we're not, we didn't get any successful results. So the next thing we did was tr we tried to eliminate the, the the these embeddings. So as I can show you in the the image where we collected the data, there is a great variability over which portion of the test plot that you imaged when you're driving uh, a camera over top of it. So in other words, we're not capturing the exact same view of uh, the test plot each time. So the idea, uh, the idea that this starts to become uh, a representative feature of the plot at that particular point in time uh, does not hold. And so we just tried doing concatenation um, with these feature vectors. Uh, and then we ended up just trying to uh, get rid of this portion of the network and just doing a simple uh, principal component analysis uh, of the output to see if that would just um, if that would also uh, lead lead to uh, good results. And at the end of the day, the best uh, model that we could come up with is shown here: visual and transformable principal component analysis and support vector machines. But as you can see from the plots. Um, the results, uh, they're not meeting uh, what the, they're not meeting our performance goals. And so one of the things that we need to do is we need to increase the, the data set, but we also have some ideas for uh, next uh, season imaging. And we want to incorporate some of the root information uh, as well as a, an additional vector that would provide input information into 
uh, into the model making of the decision. But I think one of the main reasons why the time series was not successful in the approaches that we were showing you is the variable location of the camera and with respect to imaging the plot. So one of the things we're going to consider, and we spoke with Emily about for next summer, is can we do uh, georeferencing? Maybe we can use drone imagery to capture the entire plot in one image, and we need more frequent uh, data collection uh, as well. Okay. So in terms of future directions uh, and collaboration opportunities, I mentioned before, we, we have an SCAP submission where we want to bring everything that we've done with the FHB work together. Uh, we want to develop a, a systematic pipeline for uh, assessing the severity indoors, and that'll build on those 3D point cloud approaches and our photogrammetry work that I mentioned. And we then also want to somehow port uh, our models to outdoors, whether that uh, entails uh, using 3D point clouds or a method like I showed earlier with that uh, 2D methods, uh, that's still uh, an open research question. Um, we have a CARP submission for using uh, drone-based uh, drone data, uh, and there's lots of researchers in this room, uh, Rob, Dilshan, um, our uh, collaborators on, on this approach, uh, where we want to use drone data and to, uh, to determine uh, field level real time monitoring of canola feed free BW correlation. And uh, one, one thing that I'm also interested in is I do a lot of work, or we do a lot of work with remote sensing. Uh, so, for instance, uh, this map of land use land classification map was produced um, by uh, this remote sensing satellite data, uh, Landsat 8 multi spectral 6 band. I think there's a lot of opportunity to uh, look at solutions from a multi-scale da data perspective, where you make some sort of decision at the, um, at the satellite level, uh, go and collect further information at the drone level and uh, make a further decision and then take some sort of action at the ground, uh, at the ground scale. Uh, and then finally, uh, collaboration opportunities. So uh, a lot of you are probably uh, familiar with uh, these different generative uh, image-based uh, methods. So this is the string that I asked uh, that I used to create uh, this image. Uh, and what I want to say here is, I think um, you know I'm open, and our research group is open for lots of uh, collaboration opportunities. My department, in particular, hired 11 people in the last few years. Um, I am one of those 11 people. We're hiring two more uh, this year, and I'm, I, I have conversations with them that they're interested in exploring more work like this. And there's so many problems to work on uh, that there's, there's more problems uh, than there are people to tackle the job. And I think we just need to continue building uh, local capacity. Uh, you know, there's other jurisdictions that are ahead of us, maybe Saskatchewan, Australia, the U.S., but we have everything we ha we need locally in order to become a, a global leader uh, in this area. So I just wanted to end on that note. If you're interested in collaborations, uh, let, let's chat and figure out, um, you know, what we can do to move forward. And then uh, thank you all for listening today. And come Thanks, Chris. Excellent presentation. Uh, so, any questions for Chris? I know we have just a few minutes, and uh, you certainly can leave at any time. But can I? Uh, who wants to break the yes. yeah, In terms of how this technology might work for farmers, mm -hmm. like I can see how you know, like detecting FHB, you can you can you know find your threshold where you need to spray the fungicide, whatever. Um, I guess for the detection of the weeds, is, is there a certain idea that you have to have a really precision kind of weed control thing where you can identify each one? Is that, is that the goal? So there's definitely researchers in this room that can speak better this than I can, but I'll give you a computer science answer and then you can talk with the plant scientists uh, in more detail. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, well, right now, all weeds are blanket sprayed. The whole, like, the whole field is blanket sprayed. So by being able to just spray each weed individually, you're reducing your inputs. But even if you still spray every weed in the field, uh, now you're breeding for breeding herbicide-resistant uh, weeds. Sure. 
And so the idea that Rob's team, uh, Rob and Dilshan, are looking at is how to determine which weeds actually uh, should be sprayed and which ones uh, shouldn't. Okay. Well, I sort of thought. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions for uh, Chris? Dilshan. Okay. Dilsha. okay. That's the presentation. So my question for regarding my basic weed project. So when it comes to the real scanning, like 3D scanning, is it that's the way you want to go forward? How you can do that in, in the field? Okay, um, so in the field level, we would most likely take our experience, well, the goal right now is to take our experience with photogrammetry. Uh, but to do it outdoors, uh, which you cannot see in any of our photos, but our data rover has um, position. We have a, a boom that can take four or six uh, different sensors on the front of it. So as long as you position uh, those cameras so that you can get multiple views of the thing that you're looking at, um, you can uh, then you can get your 3D point clouds uh, through um, uh, through these different photogrammetry methods. Uh, so we're going to explore that for sure, because that's the point that we came from. But that other work from the University of Guelph, uh, you know, that it may be the shortest path forward to getting a, a model on the rover that actually uh, achieves the goal. And then we can just research the point cloud stuff on, on our own out of curiosity. Uh, first, Inoka, then Glenn. Inoka, go ahead. Machine learning is not my area, and I'm also weed science, but I, I teach pesticides, so I have a little general question. This is more of a larger scale, so I don't expect teaching or pregnancy, but maybe like, for example, carbon sequestration or net zero, we have like a kind of set goals, right? Zero carbon in 2050 or something. So with these techniques, like uh, what is the, if you if the, they are talking about it, I know nothing about this. So like a 50% reduction in pesticide frequency or pesticide 50% redu reduction in pesticide active ingredients. So what do you, is there a kind of a target if this technology moves to somewhere in 2030 or 2050 or like that? I don't have the background to answer that question, but if there's anyone here that can answer it. Um, yeah, the, the, main, the main thing that we... Uh, do in terabyte is if we're developing a model, we want to show it uh, working in the field. And then we work with uh, groups like Emily, where if we show that it's, here's a solution that's working in the field, um, we work, we partner with them to get the word out, talk with other industry, other businesses, and help with the commercialization process. Uh, so we really kind of stop at the technology readiness level where it's uh, demonstrated in the field. I think to you next question, and that's related to that. And uh, my, my mini, mini response would be yes, I think that's the intent mm -hmm. is to reduce applications through targeted applications. So, on definitely that's TRL 789 mm -hmm. down the road. That those on the emission side, uh, recently there's the, well, in the last few months, there's lots of conversations around the energy use of AI computation and data centers. And I don't know if you're considering the Electrical efficiency of these units, A, from while well, they're remote until they have a power source. I see you have solar panels. And so farm equipment has to have the power source to power that. And if they go to battery powered units, what draw would be on that? That's, and, then, and then from the computational side, if you're in the cloud, then you're using, you're needing computational power in other places of the world where these things exist, these data centers. Is that part of the Sort of the back of your mind, is it in there somewhere? It's still a lot going, but it's a little, very, very busy. That might be later on. But yeah, that's uh that's definitely a concern uh to the machine learning industry as a whole. So just on the computer science machine learning research, uh people are investigating ways to get at the same performance level with less uh less uh computation. And so one of the and I can give an example with the stable diffusion, uh, but one of the first fusion versions that came out that this is one of those image-based generative methods. It needed a lot more data and a lot more compute than one of the more recent versions. 
And, and so that's that's definitely on our mind. Some of uh, my work uh, that I've done with uh, polynomial neural networks is showing that you can get the same type of performance with less computation. So uh, it's it's it the industry as a whole is working on research to achieve performance by reducing computation because it is it's a cost the environment but and it's also a like a dollar value cost if you can reduce the the training time. Uh, in terms of these particular models and going in the field, uh, that's like a that's a different type of en engineering problem. So once you get a model that um, has a level of performance that you want, there are optimization techniques that can also reduce the amount of computation that's required to get it operating in the field, and um, which then corresponds to um, less power consumption uh, as well. Um, so. That's um that's another problem, but also active area research, and there's methods for optimizing it for low power consumption. Mario, Chris, um, you have lots of tools that you're using, and I was just kind of wondering there, there must be lots of jobs in the competition around IP uh, <laughs> in this space, and yeah. you never mentioned that. Once. Well, okay, yeah. Give us a little bit of a glimpse of working in this area, because to me it would be almost uh, cumbersome to work in because of the IP and uh, particularly um, university administration <laughs> mounting IP. And things like any comment on working in this space uh, from having fun and science and um, IP stuff? It's true. Uh, okay, so the question was, uh, how does IP uh, play into all of this work? Uh, it can be uh, a barrier for sure. Uh, I'm learning uh, the bureaucracy in terms of um, IP and ter uh, with respect to getting your project out the door. Our, our main funding for creating labeled data sets and machine learning models was uh, so that whatever we developed uh, would be publicly available. So that was from our work from 2019 to 2022. So we kind of leapfrogged uh, a lot of uh, that IP discussion. Um, what I try to work with the uh, lawyers and I guess the IP officers is that um, when, we, when we put forward one of these submissions that everyone retains their background IP and that any IP that arises from the project um, is discussed at a, a later at a later point, trying to kick it down the road. Uh, we'll see if that's um, if if that's a, a feasible approach. Uh, but it does uh, come into the conversation, and I find the best way to do it is to get every person that's involved in the IP process into the room, just talking with each other instead of back and forth over emails. It's a barrier to a lot of this work, though, for sure. Just gonna ask you something. Right. You mentioned the, the low ground imaging around root nodules oh, and so forth. Right. Really interesting stuff. I didn't even know you guys went to that. Can you speak a bit more how your tools can maybe help some of our soil science more right. people that work in that in that soil plant, um, you know, critical zone? That's right. Yeah, thank you. So I didn't uh, come circle back to that, I forgot to. Um so for the root work, the first step. Uh, is automated nodule detection. And that, I think, is a pretty straightforward um, computer vision approach. Those roots are grown in riso boxes, and they're like these clear boxes that are, um, everyone here probably knows way more about it than I do. Um, so that's the first step. I think that that's easily achievable. Uh, we just need a certain data set size, and we can get there. But the part that I'm interested in is an area of machine learning that's kind of uh, become quite successful is uh, graph neural networks. So they're neural networks that operate on graph data. And uh, what you can do is if you can train a model on uh, these graph, uh, that you can root structures naturally lend themselves to a graph structure. Yep. So uh, develop, we have a method actually that we're working on right now that had, can get a graph from a root structure. From there, we're looking at different ways to, to make autoencoders. So what an autoencoder is, is you just, uh, you give an image to the network if you're working with image data, and it just needs to learn how to reproduce uh, that image on the output. But then in once it's trained, you cut off the, the final end of it, and it produces a compressed representation of that element uh, as input. And so what I think uh, 
can be really helpful to some of these models is if we tra train a graph-based autoencoder. So it takes these, this root information as input uh, via this graph structure. Uh, we create this autoencoder, once it's trained, cut off the endpoint, and now we get a compressed representation of the graph that corresponds to the root imagery that we have. And that can be used as input, as additional input to different models. So we're not going to be able to image the root in the ground. At least I know there's other people that are doing that work. But what could happen is if you were, for instance, doing phenotyping on tent plots, you know what um, variety is planted in that plot. You can randomly go and select one of your roots from that same variety mm -hmm. and then extract that, uh, that feature vector and then provide that as additional input to the model when it's making its uh, P yield prediction, for example. And so that's that's uh, where I want to move with the, the root structure. And I think I think that's uh, could provide some useful information. Yeah, it also speaks to the whole carbon sequestration bit and uh, nitrogen utilization efficiency and all that. So getting that information uh, would be critical, I'm sure, in those areas. Uh, any other questions for Chris? Yes, go ahead, uh, Dr. Community. You mentioned the last time since so data that you're recycling on the science science thing. But why wouldn't you be able to generate, like when you're cycling that, when you generate it samples by your own uh, neural networks to feed the data into your problem from the network to get a confidence of fresh problem? Why wouldn't you be able to see anything from the time source data? Oh, I guess um, I should have qualified how it wasn't six. So the question is, how come you can't use some of your other machine learning models uh, to contribute to your P prediction work? So what we're trying to do with the P prediction is we have a whole bunch of varieties. And at the end of the season, we measure you know, how much peas they produce. We measure the yield. And we want to, as early as possible in the season, develop a method that can help uh, predict what the yield will be for those varieties to help with the breeding and phenotyping process. So what we are finding is that the network, uh, with, with all the varieties that we have, I think it was 12, the network uh, cannot uh, distinguish between um, the RGB Im above ground imagery and cannot find a relationship between the above ground imagery and the yield that was generated at the end of the season. We were hoping there was gonna be some sort of pattern that was present in the data that the model could extract and correlate with uh, the yield. And then we also did our own manual analyses and uh, we, like, we looked at different vegetative indices. Um, we tried counting the pea pods themselves, we tried counting flowering, that sort of thing. And we didn't find any correlation across those uh, varieties as well. But we wonder if we just didn't have enough samples throughout the season. Uh, and maybe that would provide the necessary information because different varieties uh, could flower at different times, depending on even the environmental conditions is what I understand. So I think we need, we, it's a, we need more data at this point. Yeah, highly complex system. Can you leave the last question also, Andrew? And then yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, what I want to ask is uh, how do you deal with uh, creating RGB images? Uh, the cloud cover and everything will actually change the, the black text, right? So, and also shading. It's true. So, what my, uh, my, uh, I think the best word. Well, my goal was that if we had enough data, the models can see through that variation. Uh, I don't think we're at that point where we have enough data. Um, the models do machine learning models. If you have enormous amounts of data, like 13 million uh, labeled images, they can start to see through some of that noise. But in practice, what other people are doing, other research groups that are doing the same thing uh, as we are doing, is they have these big. Um, you have light boxes or they have shade boxes in order to try to maintain the consistency of the uh, the light that's going into the sensor. So that is, that is an issue. Well, let me thank Chris again for joining us today. And uh, please help me thank him for today's presentation and future collaborations. So 